Hello students, welcome to the lecture on competitive marketing strategies and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand the concept of competitive marketing strategies, discuss about market research and competitive intelligence, describe the structure of competitive marketing strategies, understand the concept of market segmentation and explain the application of differentiation strategy. Let us begin with our lecture. We have all heard someone in the course of business say that marketing is fluff and hype. However, the wisest, savviest and most successful business people understand that marketing is far from that. Marketing is everything one does on a daily basis to sell a product or provide a service to a customer. Marketing encompasses every way in which a customer perceives a business and everything that generates enough interest from a customer and encourages customers to actually pay for the product or services. As Peter Vassins suggests, cash may be king, but marketing is everything. What does it really mean to market our service or product? Often people immediately equate marketing with advertising and see only the amount of money that advertising will cost. However, by definition, marketing is actually the process by which we offer goods or services up for sale. Forward-thinking marketing strategists suggest that marketing is not a cost or expense, but rather an investment, because much of the benefit of marketing is longer term and may take years to fully provide its benefit. Marketing has also been referred to as a social and management process by which individuals and groups obtain what they need and want through creating, offering and exchanging products of value with others. Additionally, it is all too often equated only with the more focused function of selling, but marketing encompasses a wider range of activities that must be a fully integrated process and indeed will form a foundation and catalyst for making sales. What then is the key to a consistent proactive marketing strategy? First and foremost, it is a philosophy that dedicates resources of the firm to ensuring that the ones needs and demands of the customer are the firm's focus. This customer focus mentality is the foundation of the strategy that makes up the entire marketing process. Second, it is a plan supported by the firm's philosophy. Once the philosophy is in place, a plan can give direction, guidance and a structure for proactive strategies that will increase sales and improve business relationship. Often firms find themselves dedicating resources to marketing activities from trade shows to flyers and spending money on marketing that is not targeted to the right audience at the right time. This is reactive marketing with a shotgun rather than a rifle. Conversely, a proactive focused marketing plan can provide guidance for targeting the right audience at the right place and at the right time, which in turn maximizes the return on investment and increases revenues. Third, marketing is a process of creating value for the customer. It is a set of activities to educate, communicate with and motivate the targeted consumer about the firm's services or the company's product and services. Traditionally, the set of activities, the marketing mix, is represented by four parts. The well-known four P's of marketing, price, product, placement and promotion but to create a marketing strategy and plan that touch on all areas necessary to, to position a product in the market to maximize the sales, revenues, there are multiple areas to be tackled. Businesses gather information every day in the form of invoices, proposal, daily sale figures and time cards. This information can provide a business insight into their operations, create a platform for decision making and reveal ideas that feed strategic planning. Gathering the information requires a consistent and reliable process in order for the information to be useful. Information management requires a system that supports the business model. The information comes from one of the first steps in developing an overall marketing strategy is to perform a market segmentation analysis as a way to manage a strategy development process and ensure its effectiveness and success. The concept behind market segmentation is intuitive and relatively simple. Market segmentation is simply taking a look at the overall market for our product and service and thinking of it in terms of smaller, more manageable pieces. 
To build a strong and durable house, it is necessary to create blueprints. Likewise, to build a strong and profitable business, it is necessary to develop a strategy. Essentially, marketing strategy is a plan that allows the business owner to direct activities that are consistent with the goals of the business owner and organization and spend money wisely in order to create the greatest amount of return on investment. To thoroughly understand what is happening in the industry in which one operates, it is invaluable to know what the trends in the industry are as well as what the firm's competitors are doing to make money to improve their business and to improve their own market shares. Market research is necessary to make better firm-wide decisions with marketing being a philosophy where the resources and activities of the firm or company are focused on satisfying the wants and needs of the customer, marketing research is a way a firm with a marketing philosophy determines what those wants and needs may be and further how to communicate the associated benefits most effectively and efficiently. Additionally, market research is used to monitor and modify, if needed, the elements of the marketing strategy. Market research includes defining the problem and research objectives, developing a research plan, presenting the plan, implementing the plan, collecting and analyzing data, and interpreting and reporting the findings. This is the area of marketing where we begin to see science as well as art. This chapter focuses in detail how to research market, how to know the competition, and how to leverage that knowledge to improve our business. An excellent definition of market research is this. The systematic collection of information on existing or potential markets for analysis and subsequent action. In order to be successful at marketing, that is, to offer the right customer value proposition, you need to find out what's going on in your chosen market. Specifically, identify customer needs and wants, understand the competition, and analyse the market dynamics. From this, you can then meet those needs and outperform the competition. In this way, research is used as an input to analysis and subsequent decision making. It can be used to find new markets and to ascertain your customers' real needs. It can tell you what you're doing well and not so well. To summarise, research helps you to minimise risk, focus efforts and maximise return on investment. But how do we carry out research? It's always important to know what you want to find out before you begin, so as not to waste time, effort or money. This is why before starting, it's necessary to clarify your research objectives. You need to know why you want the information, what you'll do with it, and the format it should be in. There are many ways of getting information, but first ask, has it already been done before by somebody else? This is often much cheaper and easier to obtain. You find out by carrying out desk research. If it hasn't been done before or you can't access it, then you'll have to undertake field research. Most textbooks on market research will give you a huge list of sources for conducting desk research. Specialist libraries, trade associations, market research associations, government publications, trade journals, periodicals, and so on. But you and I both know that in this day and age, research starts in a pretty familiar place. Google. If it exists, and you know the right keywords, wherever it is, you'll track it down with Google. And so, if you can't find out the information you want by desk research, then you have to find out for yourself. Whether we're talking about a large corporation or someone working individually, it's a logical process that starts, as I've said, with setting a research objective. Usually this is arrived at by identifying exactly what the problem is that you are to solve. In most cases, the objective is to find out in detail what your target customers want, or at least a variation on this. My advice is keep it simple. Should the product be bigger or smaller? Would customers like more colour options? Do they want faster delivery at a higher price? Those kind of easy to answer, clearly defined questions. Once you've established your objective, 
The next question is, how large should the sample be? The number of people questioned is very important in any type of research. Fortunately, it's not necessary to ask such large numbers of your target market to get a reliable answer. There is agreement among researchers that the actual size of sample necessary to represent the population is fairly low, because after a certain point, there is little appreciable improvement in accuracy, no matter how many more people you ask. Even for most consumer goods, it's in the low hundreds out of a potential market of millions. The absolute minimum for any research sample that you want to analyse statistically is 30. Provided that you have a homogeneous range, that is, the same type of people who display similar characteristics. They might be similar ages, the same sex, be from the same region or have the same occupation, lifestyle and so on. But if you want to generalise, you need to have found a group of that nature. From here, there are essentially two approaches to research. Quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative questions require a specific answer. For example, how many do you like? The answers are easy to analyse because they fit a pattern. The drawback is that they may be inaccurate because they don't provide in-depth explanation. Qualitative questions allow people to describe feelings. They are harder to analyse, but provide richer information. For example, how could we improve our service? Which new feature would you like added? Depending on your objective, you'll want to use either a quantitative or qualitative approach or a combination of both. The main research tools are telephone interviews, written questionnaire questionnaires, which are often online nowadays, and face-to-face -face interviews. Other methods include product testing, consumer panels, observation and focus groups. Since written questionnaires are the most commonly used research tool, I'll give them some extra attention. Their use is widespread among all types of organisation. They can be administered either by the researcher or self-administered, whereby the respondent fills in his or her own answers. You'll find this research tool is either received and returned by the post, or completed online or in store. A self-administered questionnaire is passive, so it relies on the goodwill of the respondent for completion. It's relatively easy and cheap to run, and you'll find that structure is vital. Questions need to be simple, clear, and not subjective. For a written questionnaire, there are five main types of question you can ask. Like at scale questions, which show agreement levels, usually a statement is given along with strongly agree through to strongly disagree. With importance questions, there's simply a rating of the weighting factor, weighting of a factor, unimportant, neutral, important, etc. Rating questions usually measure an attribute from poor through to excellent. Meanwhile, multiple choice questions offer a limited number of choices to choose from, with two or more options. Lastly, open-ended questions allow the respondent to make comments on a subject in their own words. As well as questions relating to the subject you're researching, you'll also want to ask demographic questions, the age, sex, occupation type of questions, so that you can segment the results and get a clearer picture of your target ma market. What's left after doing the actual research is the analysis. The main task is to interpret the data, identifying patterns and meaning. At a basic level, this usually involves counting the number of responses, ratings and scores across the sample and working out the averages or ranges. The findings should all relate back to your research objective and effectively they should answer the problem that you set out to solve. With all this done, your research is ready to be used in decision making at a strategic level. To summarise, the purpose of market research is to collect information on markets, in other words current or potential customers, to enable a better understanding of the market so you can better serve customer needs and wants. Ideally, you should know your market's size, dynamics, who the competitors are, and precisely what your customers want and need. The research findings you generate are analysed and used to determine tactical changes and improvements to the product or service offering, and in turn, to determine the organisation's overall future strategic direction.
To sell a product for a particular price, value must be created. Value is the consumer's estimate of the product's overall capacity to satisfy his or her needs. When the value placed on a product or service is high, then satisfaction is achieved. Consumers are savvy and will choose based on the level of satisfaction that corresponds with the price. If a bottle of Coca-Cola were priced at $1.05 while a liter of Pepsi Cola was priced at $1.01, it is likely that the sales of Coke would decrease. If these were the only two options at the supermarket, the likelihood of Pepsi sales increasing is high. Hello, I'm Michael Shirain. Today we'll be talking about strategic differentiation, the top priority of industry leaders. It starts with the premise that differentiation was once a choice of strategy. Today it needs to be part of any strategy. It wasn't taught that way in business school. Many management teams don't think of it that way. And sometimes the idea of differentiation is associated with things like branding that don't always appeal to every member of a management team. But in reality, differentiation is the reason industry leaders have achieved what they have achieved. We'll look at four companies that you could say have built strategic differentiation. We'll look at it from different perspectives. It starts with a very obvious example. The auto industry, in most markets all of these brands are available, but somehow we make clear decisions. We boil it down to a short list. And sometimes we can look at those, those decisions as, as obvious in so much that we don't even think about the differentiation behind the companies. But it has been built systematically over time. If we just take that example further, think about Volvo. What is it that made them who they are? We believe that you can look behind a brand, a positioning statement, you can look behind the communications, and you find what we call operational evidence. That strong companies have built their leadership on facts on the rational side as well. Safety systems innovation, superior crash test performance, that's what is behind Volvo. BMW is different. They appeal to the same segment in terms of demographics and, and income, but they're very different. They focus on the experience of driving. They win awards for different things, combining luxury, combining design and engineering in a new way. You can also look at B2B examples, where the two largest printing paper companies, UPM, Cumina, and Stora Enso, they sit across from each other in the harbor in Helsinki. Globally, the largest in printing papers. Very demanding environment where publishers and printers rely on fewer and fewer errors. They rely on, on a, a level of, of perfection that, uh, that these two companies have achieved. But still, they're very, very different. Similar sizes, similar profitability. But when you look at the customers that they appeal to, the values that they share, people like IKEA, People like Time Warner prefer UPM paper. They share the same value. The focus on customer relationship management, the focus on continuous improvement. The humble leader. We lead, we learn. Store Enzo is a little different, a little bit more, more flamboyant, a little bit more openly innovative. The, the pushing the boundaries of paper, you know, what paper can do. And they appeal to others. Many times you'll find that, that, that the more innovative uh, or, or fashion-oriented uh, more trend-oriented publications are on store and so papers. You can't make that distinction completely, but when you talk to the people from each company, when you talk to people that buy from each company uh, around the world, paper, uh, paper buyers have told us that difference so clearly. And when you then look at the way they manage the businesses, you see that. When you look at the operational evidence, you see that. So what is it that makes that happen? Well, these companies don't only develop a traditional strategy, which of course they have to be good at, but when they're targeting a desired industry ranking, they also know they have to target a desired reputation. Another element of traditional strategy, optimizing a portfolio of businesses. These companies also know they have to optimize a portfolio of brands. They align their organization with their strategy, but they also align their culture with the reputation they want to build. That takes different skills, different tools. Their marketing drives sales, but their marketing also drives positioning, the way people think about them in their minds across their entire value chain. And finally, they're good at tracking financial performance, but they're also good at understanding their positioning performance. Whether it's a, a track record of innovation, or it's case studies of successes with customers, they can prove it, and that's really what makes industry leaders what they are. Traditional strategy is generally developed in a hierarchical way. Corporate management sets the process in motion, makes the request down to the units, business units look at their markets, investment priorities feed that back up, Corporate strategy is then developed and rolled back out through the organization. And companies are getting better and better at that. There's more involvement, there's more interaction. Strategic differentiation is a little bit different. 
And that is that it needs to be built across a value chain. That the company is only one stakeholder in that. And it has to be thought of that way and developed that way, but also implemented that way. And again, that takes different skills, different priorities. So we're not talking about a change of organizational structure or, or strategic thinking in general. We're actually talking about adding something to that, which would be strategic differentiation built systematically across a value chain. So if we take a step back and say, well, let's think about that. What would it mean to interact with a value chain? In fact, most companies aren't able to do that in a systematic way because their functions are often not connected or the way that their, their business in, interact with the market are often not as tightly integrated as they could be. So if we rethink that and say, what if our number one priority was actually to manage our value chain, not just our company? Not to leave it to sourcing or, or purchasing relationships to guide our suppliers, and not to leave it to marketing to guide what we do in the market, but actually to systematically develop a management approach to our value chain. It would start by understanding the interactions across our value chain. What bonds people together? What is it in that sourcing negotiation, or in that recruitment interview, or in that sales meeting, or in that advertising that links back to the other things people experience when they interact that builds one common position across a value chain? Well, if we can do that well, then we can drive volume and pricing. And that, of course, is the goal of most marketing activities, building demand, building pressure on the other side of distribution. Uh, and driving volume and pricing, many companies have become very good at. Industry leaders can also drive future trends on which they rely. That gives them the volume and pricing uh, influence, but it also gives them the influence three to five years down the road for future products. The influence that, that allows them to truly guide the way their market thinks. And that's often why they're called industry leaders, even if they're not the biggest. Many are recognized as leaders. They're also able to guide innovation, internally, but also with their partners. Guiding where they're going because they're so confident, they're so clear, about their own positioning across their value chain. They're so focused and able to execute on strategic differentiation as well as strategic uh, thinking in, in the more traditional sense. What if our number one priority was actually to manage our value chain, not just our company? Let's think about that. What would it mean to interact with a value chain? In fact, most companies aren't able to do that in a systematic way because their functions are often not connected, or the way that their, their business in, interact with the market are often not as tightly integrated as they could be. Not to leave it to sourcing or, or purchasing relationships to guide our suppliers, and not to leave it to marketing to guide what we do in the market, but actually to systematically develop a management approach to our value chain. It would start by understanding the interactions across our value chain. What bonds people together? What is it in that sourcing negotiation, or in that recruitment interview, or in that sales meeting, or in that advertising that links back to the other things people experience when they interact that builds one common position across a value chain? What would it be that could take control of that value chain in that way? Well, we have to understand the interactions well. We need a management tool that focuses people on the right thing regardless of where they are in the value chain. What we do is simplify that to say that at each interaction point, there's an internal and an external bias, whether it's experience or priority or loyalty, there's an internal or external bias, and an emotional and rational piece of that experience. Again, whether it's a sales meeting or an ad or a, a sourcing relationship. If we can put something in the middle of that, we call that a positioning strategy. You can think of it as clear purpose direction that a company's taking. And if that direction, that purpose, is true, relevant, and high value to everyone across a value chain, they can work together to achieve it. So that's the idea of a positioning strategy. Once you understand that, once you understand the simple way of describing your purpose and direction, then you can start talking about optimizing a portfolio of brands to reflect that. A corporate brand could be unit brands, could be product brands, could be branded commitments. Then you can also develop cultural uniqueness. Not just a good company culture, of course, Industry leaders have strong culture, but they have cultural uniqueness, meaning that the cultural traits that people know them for, that when you meet their people, it's reflected in the way they do things, it directly relates to their positioning strategy. So it's cultural uniqueness. On the rational side of things, it's about operational evidence. What you find is that good companies uh, do a lot of things right. But the best companies know which things to prioritize and lift up as the proof that they are who they say they are. 
They know how to pull those key metrics, those cases, those examples of their success and say, this is why, because it links to our positioning strategy. And finally, there's the alignment of marketing, which in many ways is the easiest once you have these other things clear. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at industry leaders from that perspective. We call it a quadric. And that quadric framework helps us understand the differentiation of these companies, how they're building it over time, and in fact can be updated over time and see the changes. And it reveals a lot. Pricing is what our customer is willing to trade in return for a product. That is, the value they place on a product or service. Generally, a price or quality relationship exists where the higher the price, the higher the quality, especially in the case of personal services, consumer will expect a higher level of service with the fee associated with that service is higher relative to other providers of similar services. Marketers may elect to skim the market with a relatively high price at first and then as demand wanes at this relatively high price, gradually lower the price. New innovative products often use this pricing strategy because their newness and uniqueness may enable a higher price at first. As copycats and competitors enter the market, prices will fall to meet the market price. Some marketers, though, may use a penetration strategy where the product or service is offered at a very low price in order to quickly grab market share and be considered the low price provider. A customer will not likely purchase a service or product unless it can be relatively easily assessed. Placement can be anything from a magazine or candy bar sitting next to the checkout counter at the supermarket. A spontaneous purchase to gas station situated on the right-hand corner of the exit from a highway or to the location of an orthodontics office in the same complex as a pediatrician's office. Placement helps make the purchasing process for a customer easier and more convenient. Often the term distribution is used interchangeably for the placement component of a marketing strategy and includes a decision a company or firm must make to ensure the connection with the customer or client. Placement is how the marketer connects the products or services with the customer. The easier, more convenient, more accessible the product or service may be, the more likely the customer will purchase the product or service. All of the aforementioned parts of the marketing plan cannot be carried out to the full level of effectiveness without all areas of value chain working together. Generally, the value chain includes the following activities. Inbound logistic, bringing raw materials into business, operation management of processes to create the product or service for the customer, outbound logistic, the means for getting the product or service to the customer, for example, distribution system and shippers to get products into retail stores, marketing and sales, creating value, service, aligning customer expectation and the performance of the product or service, firm infrastructure, the organization of the firm to maximize service to the customer. Successful companies that become excellent marketing organization know themselves, their customers and what they offer that fills the customer needs. This requires investment of time and money to accurately determine whether all three parts of the triangle fit together. As an example, ABC company is about 8 years old and operates in the online professional services industry. The customer wants and needs this service. Most importantly, the customer is willing to pay for the service and ABC company is the only company occupying this space at this time. One would imagine that ABC company is generating a strong and regular revenue stream. Unfortunately, ABC company's CEO does not believe in investing in consistent marketing strategies and targeted marketing initiatives. As set forth in the preceding section, marketing is the process of building a strategic plan. However, without buy in from the organization as a whole, becoming a marketing organization is more challenging. A marketing organization is not a firm that sells marketing services. A marketing organization is a firm regardless of industry function, size or region in which all levels of the organization adhere to the same ideals and uniform methods for attaining customer. As an example, Southwest Airlines has created a marketing organization. It has three company policies, practice the golden rule, we have a choice every day and choose to make our employees our first customers and our passengers our second customer, help each other out, 
Southwest ensured that these messages as well as any marketing message is integrated throughout every part of the organization and in every point of contact with the customer, nothing that the customer is both the Southwest employee as well as the purchasing passenger. This ability on Southwest part to create a marketing organization or a marketing culture allowed it to weather economic downturns and adverse industry trends. Becoming a marketing organization also allows the entire team to understand the value value of the firm's products to the customer and behave in a manner in which selling is a way of life. For example, a consulting firm may have strategic consultants working on projects at the client's office. Because of this situation, the consultants are able to observe the client's business processes at every stage and thus have an inside view of the needs of the client. Strategy is a bridge that connects a firm's internal environment with its external environment leveraging its resources to adapt to and benefit from changes occurring in its external environment. Strategy is also a decision-making process that transfers a long-term vision into day-to-day -day tactics to affect the long-term plan. Although often thought of only as something reflected in a business plan, strategy is rather a continual process of assessment, resessment and analysis which constantly provides direction to the firm. Strategy can be compared to the captain on the bridge of a ship who is constantly scanning both the horizon and the immediate surroundings and adjusting the course, possibly taking this ship in another direction if a storm appears on the horizon or if an object appears to obstruct the path. The position the firm fills in the marketplace is an integral part of the strategic process. Positioning can also be thought of as how the firm will stake a claim in a piece of the marketplace in a manner that will differentiate it from competitors. The key to sustainable strategy and positioning is an integrated marketing system. Competitive advantage comes from the ability to identify the firm's position, make strategic plans and engage an entire integrated marketing system. All activities of the firm should fit together and complement each other to produce a well-oiled machine which creates differentiation in the customer's mind and competitive advantage. Strategy involves all areas of the firm from operation to finance to human resources. While strategy is the overall direction, the long-term mile markers and or the guiding force of how the organization moves forward, tactics are the specific steps that are taken to implement the strategy. Strategy tends toward the longer term. Tactics are the shorter term steps taken to achieve the long term strategy. For example, XYZ company is a health and fitness center. Strategically, the firm leadership has decided to develop a center targeted at 30 to 65 year old women and create a comfortable environment in which she can exercise, lose weight and learn more healthy life habits. The firm's strategic geographic positioning is to provide centers in suburban areas where the largest number of these women live. The tactics used for carrying out this strategy include developing consistent messages and advertisement reflecting the mission of the firm targeted to this market segment, hiring other women trainers so the woman customer will be comfortable and providing health and fitness educational materials specific to the mature woman customer that will create a relationship between XYZ company and this market segment. Conductive environment in all respect is an essential requirement. It is elaborated as under. Best analysis. Although easy to remember and easily forgotten by firms in developing a long-term strategy, a PES analysis is an acronym for analyzing the external environment, political, economic, sociological, demographic and technological and setting the stage for strategic planning. Also known as environmental scanning, the PES analyst reviews the environment of a market, whether emerging or existing, and provides a snapshot of the external situation that may impact an industry or the firms within that industry. Political environment, often considered more relevant when entering a foreign market. The political situation in any new or existing market is invaluable to study and understand. Existing government policies and regulation can deter new entrants into an economic, particularly in underdeveloped or developing areas of the world, or can swiftly affect incumbents in an industry with new regulation and policies that can have both positive and negative results. 
For example, even though the Graham Leach Blilly Act in the 1990s in the United States repealed the New Deal era, Glass Steagall Banking Act and allowed some financial companies to expand their services, it also impacted those firms because they were not permitted to sell both institutional and investment services. In the 1970s, Harvard economist Michael Porter created the gold standard for how strategy is created and analyzed today. Referred to as Porter's five forces, this method analyzes the industry and competitive environment in which a firm operates. When developed correctly, the framework paints a picture of the current environment in which the firm competes, allowing the firm to see the big picture and in turn develop long-term strategies for the company that will lead to effective decision-making and sustainability. Porter believes that an industry potential profitability can be expressed as a function of these five forces and that one can therefore determine the potential success of a firm in that industry. Porter's five forces provide a model for reviewing the outside environment portion of the strategy bridge and for determining the attractiveness of a particular activity at a particular moment in time. This model can be used on any form of any size in any location in any industry and can be utilized regularly to keep a constant eye on the market, the direction of the market and the competitors coming and going within that market. It is different forms as under barriers to entry. Barriers to entry refer to forces that deter companies from entering a particular market. In general terms, one will hear such references as the barriers to entry in the telecommunication market are extremely high or the barriers to entry in the ice cream industry appear to be quite low. Barriers to entry are just as important for firms that are incumbent in industry as well as the newcomers because of the threat of new entrants. Economies of sale these refer to the ability of a firm to mass produce a product and therefore to sell to the customer at a lower price. A competitor that does not have the luxury or means the mass produce would does not be able to compete on price but rather be forced to find another way to differentiate itself from the competition to the consumer. Product differentiation. This is the method or tactics used by a firm to give its product a more recognized value than the competitor's products. Brand identity is a powerful tool in creating value and therefore makes it difficult for a new entrant into the market to gain customer loyalty. Once the firm's internal strengths and weaknesses are realized and the external opportunities and threats are identified, next it is important to turn to a similar process of evaluating the competition. Competitor evaluation not only gives more insight into the strategies and goals of the competition, but it also provides a bird's eye view of the trends and future of the industry in which the firm operates. Competition provides a firm the opportunity to look into the future. Once all of the information is gathered, a firm can imagine the competitor's next move and either do the same if the market support it or take a different route, cutting the competition off the past. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. A firm's strategic goals are based on both internal and external knowledge. To make the most of each dollar earned by the firm, all functions must work together to create a well-oiled machine. Roadmap is the ultimate tool for guiding leaders toward making decisions that will provide sustainable growth to the company.